Hello everyone, welcome to today's oral surgery MCQs practice. Let's do some MCQs from the topic oral and maxillofacial surgery. All the questions, uh, all the topics are mixed in this practice session. Of the following, which, are, which is the most suitable anesthesia for the extraction of a mandibular deciduous molar? Inferior alveolar knob block, surface anesthesia, local infiltration, none of the above. Mandibular deciduous molar. Inferior alveolar knob block is the most suitable, no? To remove mandibular deciduous molar. Infiltration and block are equally effective for maxillary deciduous molar. For mandibular molar, block is more effective than infiltration for extraction or pulpotomy. Which of the following could occur following a fracture of the zygoma? It is mentioned it is multiple correct response question. So more than one can be correct. Following the fracture of zygoma, bruising of the ipsilateral upper buccal sulcus, anesthesia of the ipsilateral cheek that will happen, diplopia that can happen in the cases of orbital fracture but uh, in the fracture of zygoma it is unlikely. Bruising of the ipsilateral upper buccal sulcus that may be. Let's submit. Oh, epistaxis and diplopia all could be bruising, anesthesia of the ipsilateral cheek, epistaxis and diplopia. These all could be resulted from fractured zygoma. Signs and symptoms of a fractured zygoma include anesthesia or paresthesia of the cheek, side of the nose and upper lip due to damage to the infraorbital knob, epistaxis that is nose bleed, as blood drains out of the maxillary entrum and diplopia double vision usually due to edema around the eye and bruising of the upper buccal sulcus anosmia or loss of smell does not usually occur that was quite a good question the semilunar incision for caldwell look operation usually extends from maxillary canine to second molar maxillary canine to premolars maxillary incisors to canine maxillary incisors to second molar semilunar incision for Caldwell look operation. Oh, I thought it is maxillary canine to premolars, but the answer is maxillary canines to second molar. It is the correct answer. It is quite a long incision. Identify the instrument present in the collar plate. It is a ronja forceps. Yeah. In a fracture of atrophic mandible with bone loss, what is the best treatment modality? Bone grafting and load bearing, bone grafting and load sharing, semi-rigid fixation and intermaxillary fixation with open reduction. In fracture of atrophic mandible, so bone grafting and load sharing should be, load bearing should be, okay because it is atrophic mandible so load bearing should be there when the mandible is severely atrophic it is possible that healing will not occur even if open reduction internal fixation principles are correctly applied in some circumstances treatment consists of bone graft reconstruction at the time of fracture repair as the mandible is severely atrophic load bearing is better as compared to load sharing that is not shearing s h a r i n g sharing only under g a Hemolysis resulting from a transfusion reaction will exhibit which of the following symptoms? Chills, fever, dyspnea, headache, pain in the back, hypotension, skin flux, tachycardia, abnormal hemorrhage, and hyperpyrexia, urticaria, angioneuritic edema, asthma, urticaria, and pruritus. These all are likely. Hemolysis resulting from a transfusion reaction. Chills, fever, dyspnea, headache, pain in the back. This uh, is the most likely okay hypotension skin flux tachycardia abnormal hemorrhage and hyperpyrexia let's see the explanation it exhibits symptoms of this not much explanation is given which is the correct acronym for a common treatment of a fractured mandible it is ORIF open reduction and internal fixation ORIF uh, this is one of the most common ways of treating a fractured mandible. It involves an operation to realign and fix the mandible in place, most commonly with plates and monocortical non-compression issues or, and or intermaxillary fixation. 
Rima and Lima stand for right internal mammary artery and left internal mammary artery respectively and are commonly used in coronary artery bypass grafting. These are the options. Okay. Surgical recontouring of alveolar ridges is called as alveoloplasty, alveolectomy, mucosinjivectomy, fibrectomy. Ectomy means taking out by excision and it is asking about surgical recontouring only. So this is alveoloplasty. Alveoloplasty is performed following multiple extractions for proper wound closure and for removal of undercut areas. Alveolectomy refers to surgical removal or trimming of alveolar process. The main aim of alveolectomy is to prepare a good bed for denture. The new bone growth for factor extensively used in grafting procedures. Bone wax, bone morphogenic protein, platelet-rich plasma and patient's own blood. The new bone growth factor extensively used in bone grafting procedures. Bone morphogenic protein, yeah. Identify the tumor shown in the image. Papilloma, lipoma, fibroma and neurofibroma. It is most likely to be a fibroma. It is the most common benign tumor of oral cavity and originates from the connective tissue. It is a reactive, rather fibrous hyperplasia in response to local irritation or trauma than a true neoplasm. Uh, the lesion typically presents as an asymptomatic, well-defined form sessile or pedunculated tumor with a smooth surface of normal epithelium. The size usually ranges from 0.5 cm to 1.5 cm in diameter. Fibroma often occurs on the buccal mucosa, gingiva, labial mucosa and tongue. It is more common between 40 and 60 years of age in both sexes. Lab diagnosis is by histopathological examination and the differential diagnosis are neurofibroma, peripheral ossifying fibroma, lipoma, myxoma, swanoma, pleomorphic adenoma and treatment is surgical removal. Forceps uh, extract forces extraction for lower premolars for lower premolar premolars which forces are used for extraction the question is asking that and since the lower premolars are conical in shape we can use apical and rotational forces primordial cyst occurs in place of a tooth in the presence of a tooth after the tooth is extracted in the midline of the mandible primordial cyst generally occurs in place of a tooth an incisional biopsy is indicated in which one of the following lesions in incisional biopsy squamous cell carcinoma if it is sufficiently large uh, fibroepithelial polyp of the lip buccal hemangioma palpable submandibular gland lump so in squamous cell carcinoma incisional biopsy is done an excisional biopsy is contraindicated in squamous cell carcinoma but is indicated for a fibroepithelial polyp. An amalgam tattoo requires no treatment. Submandible gland lumps are investigated via fine needle aspiration. A hemangioma should not be biopsied as it may well bleed dangerously and be life threatening. A 50 year old male chronic smoker complains of hoarseness for the past four months. Microlaryngoscopic biopsy shows it to be keratosis of the larynx. All are suggested treatment modalities for this condition except 50 year male smoker hoarseness since past four months. Laser vaporizer stops smoking, stripping of vocal cord, partial laryngectomy. All are suggested treatment modalities except. Vocal cord stripping should not be done. No partial laryngectomy is not a treatment protocol. Dental elevators are used for which of the following purposes? To retract the gingival crest tissue, to reflect a full mucoperiosteal flap, to engage a tooth apical to the cemento enamel junction, to engage a tooth coronal to the cemento enamel junction. Dental elevators are used to engage the tooth apical to the cemento enamel junction. This is the correct answer. The single blade dental elevator is used to luxate a tooth apical to the CEZ prior to placement of forceps. The TMJ is generally not affected in which condition? Septic arthritis, juvenile arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and degenerative joint disease. TMJ is generally not affected in septic arthritis. Yeah. 
A patient presents to your clinic with a diagnosis of an abscess. Which characteristics support your diagnosis? History of pain and swelling for three days. History of pain and swelling for one week. Predominance of anaerobic bacteria with a well circumscribed border. Predominance of aerobic bacteria with a diffuse border. Diffuse border is not seen in an abscess. In cellulitis, it is seen. So, one, two, three, all could be possible. History of pain and swelling for one week should be there, I think, because in three days it cannot be an abscess already. So, I'll go with two and three if it is there. Since two and three are not there, so I'll go with one, two, and three. Yes, that is the correct answer. An abscess is characterized by a disease process of chronic duration. Abscesses generally develop from cellulitic process and from two to three days after the onset of symptoms of pain and swelling. They may persist for long periods of time since purulence that is not drained will remain until the body removes the necrotic tissue which can be a lengthy process dependent on the extent of the abscess formation. As the infection progresses into a mature abscess, the purulence produced will compress the surrounding tissue to create granulation tissue which helps to contain the infection from spreading. This containment of the infection produces a well circumscribed border. Abscesses are composed of predominantly anaerobic bacteria with a well circumscribed border. Cellulitic processes are composed of a predominance of aerobic bacteria with a diffuse border. There is a lack of well circumscribed border in cellulitis because of the lack of purulence. Abscesses are predominantly anaerobic bacteria with a well circumscribed border. They have a chronic duration. Pen is generally localized and the borders are well circumscribed. On palpation they are fluctuant because of the presence of purulence. That's all for today. Hope you like this today's MCQ practice session. We'll see you again in the next practice session. Thank you.